Hello, in this video I will be talking about how I cut my parents and siblings out of my life. So very taboo topic. Um, I'll be sharing about my journey of going no contact. This is for the pur purposes of educating you, just sharing my particular story as the family scapegoat and how I navigated uh, my situation and my life and the impact of the bullying and also to break the don't talk about it rule uh, which is a very important rule in the dysfunctional family in order to keep the secrets in place and the shame that surrounds the secrets in place so that the secrets can continue to the next generation. So we live in an age of transparency now and these things are coming to light. Um, so I thought, it, I thought you might be interested to hear a little bit more about my story. So I went no contact with my family of origin in early 2018 and I was in my early 40s at that stage so <laughs> I am of the generation where I didn't have the benefit of the internet when I was a young adult so it took took me a while to gather the information and get the mental strength to do what I needed to do to preserve my mental health and well-being. Um, so in 2017, that was the last time I was over in Ireland. Um, I've been living in the United Kingdom since 2007, which made things a little bit easier in terms of relationships with um, family members who were very abusive towards me. Um, so yeah, that trip in 2007, I didn't know it at the time, but it was my last, it was to be my last trip uh, to visit family members, to be in the same room as parents and siblings. Um, so yeah, it took me a few months after that trip to uh, build up the courage to just cut that cord and the finality of it. I knew, I knew it would be a big moment um, and the main thing that helped me do it, um, and I will say I was building up to it for a number of years, especially from 2012 to 2017. I was doing a lot of recovery work, very deep recovery work. And the more recovery work I was doing, the deeper I was going. And obviously I was doing that myself in the background. My family were not privy to any part of my life in that regard of course you know there's only a certain element that they were seeing of me the acceptable me um so yeah so in 2017 after that trip what happened was i got very physically ill as soon as i landed back in the uk um, and I also had been getting physically ill after previous visits to and being around, being around the parents and being around the siblings and just that bullying, the sniggering, the ostracization and feeling rejected, feeling like you don't belong and feeling like a piece of dirt and not having any dignity for yourself when you're when you're with those people and, and of course it fluctuates um, but 
they're always going to pull the rug and you're going to be the butt of the jokes and that was just something that was never ending uh, from my earliest memory I was the butt of family jokes and everybody had free reign to speak to me as they wished and I had no voice with that to let them know that it was that I wasn't comfortable with that that was just a no-go area I mean I tried that when I was a teenager and the bullying increased there was all so yeah there was no no way I was just in that fawn response and very submissive and obedient and I was of course very much trauma bonded with the parents there was also that strange thing happening where they know they're abusing you they know that you know they're abusing you but you're not allowed pretend that you know that they're abusing you so I guess that's part of being trauma bonded and that was the only way that I was going to be allowed part of my family of origin if I put up with the role of the scapegoat and and yes there were times where I could maybe speak and have a normal conversation but it was very <laughs> um there wasn't there was always the underneath thing that you know you dare get ahead of yourself or you dare think you have one bit of power and you'll know about it so don't get too big for your boots um so that was what happened after that visit to Ireland in 2017 and then what happened was it was yeah my nervous system my nervous system woke up and said this I don't like this anymore I really don't like this anymore um, the denial wasn't as protecting me as I had done up until that point um, so I was coming out of layers of denial and my nervous system I was doing work with my nervous system uh, with Irene Lyme uh, for about six months prior to that visit in 2017 and that was definitely um, a contributory factor to all the things that happened to have me going completely no contact yeah so my nervous system um, was a lot more regulated and I guess I would say healthy so my nervous system was saying you know do you not realize how bad this is for us um, and it was just like um, the the bullying the rejection the abusive behavior of not one family member but four uh, like the parents and then the two siblings were very much indoctrinated into this is how we treat Mary this is how we treat Mary she's the laughing stock she's so stupid she's so different um, and also you know when you can see the look of contempt in their eyes as well and you just know that it's not healthy <laughs> and these people don't like you and it came to a certain point where I had to come out of denial I had to say okay these people do not like me and my body is now starting to respond to this like it's very difficult for me to be in the same room as them my immune system it's affecting my immune system um, so then being on the phone because we did Skype calls that became I dreaded those that became difficult and there was this other thing maybe you can relate you know the way sometimes they say things to you and it's just very eerie 
there's an eerie energy about it and that you know it's all to do with the trauma bond and your position that you're in as the family trash can and you have no say in that matter and you're an adult but you don't have any autonomy in that situation. Um, one of the parents said to me and he, they'd say it a few times was it was you know make sure you phone us every week it was like that was that was one of the rules of the contract of me being the family scapegoat and when I think about that it was my what I feel that was about was we need to make sure that you're still contracted with us to be in the role of the family scapegoat and as I say that it, it does become apparent because that was the dynamics in my family my personal situation of um, I was very much the linchpin of the entire family unit and how they operated and how they protected themselves from the real things that were going on underneath that they didn't want to look at. So the scapegoat child is the buffer for the things and the trauma and the skeletons and the closet that the elders do not want to face. So there was this, yeah, this real eerie thing of, you know, phonus phone us make sure you phone us every week because what I was doing after that trip in 2017 in the summer 2017 I was trying to prize longer periods that I would phone them so I was trying to go for two weeks um without having that Skype call and then I was trying to go for three weeks and then I was trying to come up with excuses oh, I've got a really bad cold this week I'll talk to you next week um, and that was that was making people very nervous um, and I knew I could feel I knew that wasn't okay I knew I was breaking a contract breaking an energetic contract an invisible contract an unspoken contract about my role as the family scapegoat and what I should be doing and how I should be interacting and the level of obedience that I needed within this cult of the dysfunctional family. Um, so it came to Christmas uh, 2017 and they were kind of used to me not going over, that was a pattern and then for the new year you know I got away with not doing a visit and then it came to January, February and at that point <laughs> I became ready, ready to um, cut that cord and go no contact. For me, I knew there would be no going back from it. Um, it was do or die. It was, it was very black and white. Um, I knew like it would set off a cataclysmic event and I knew they would know what I was doing because back to what I said previously about they knew that I knew that they were abusing me so it was very very tender hooks you know it was very um can't think of the word um the relationship was on thin ice it was a, fa a fantasy we were playing uh, playing roles everybody was playing roles so so I knew that they if they got wind that I was changing my tune that they would know it's like oh she oh she knows she knows now and she said it she said it so this is like game over this is we're into new territory here um, so how I did it anyway was I just sent a text um, around, I don't know, springtime, 20, early 2018 to them. <laughs> and I said, I'm taking some time out. 
Uh, I think I might have said work, you know, to focus on work. And I will be back in touch when I'm ready. They were the golden words that I used. I'll be back in touch when I'm ready, uh, which was true. I will, I will be back in touch when I'm ready. Um, I don't intend to ever be ready, but they were the words that I used. And then, yes, then things got quite hairy, uh, quite tricky. And then the hoovering started. So it was, you better, you better get in touch. And we need to hear from you. Please phone, you know, phone, like this is from my siblings phone the female parent phone the male parent um it was like it was like i was being a disobedient child it was like i'd done something wrong i'd i'd stepped out of line i wasn't playing the game anymore um there was this feeling of people being angry with me very upset and blame as well. I mean, the scapegoat child is all about blame. So very much, it's it, this is my fault. <laughs> I'm upsetting family members and this is my fault. And the way you can fix it is to pick up the phone. So a real sense that they were so desperate, so desperate to hear my voice on the phone. Uh, so they could put some sense into me, I imagine. Um, and that whole thing of, you know, the narcissist needing supply. Um, so yeah, just realize that, wow, they really need me. They really need me in this role. It just became very, very clear how much they needed me in that role. Um, and I just wasn't prepared to play ball anymore. Um, so I will say I was in a, pla a place of a certain amount of mental strength to be able to withstand that because like obviously I know my family, I know, have an idea of how they would react. Um, and it was pretty cataclysmic because in the following months one of the parents got progressively ill and as the months went on that parent got more ill and more ill and more ill and then the hoovering there was a lot of pressure you know you need to phone that parent because it would help them feel better so blame and all that uh, so in terms of me, how I navigated that and my mental health during those months after no contact, the main word that I remember about that time period of about three to six months after I went no contact and the feeling that I experienced was terror. I will say that that is the only word that is the most accurate word to describe it. It was a very terrifying time for me. I was very lucky um, that I did live in a different country and the chances of them coming over to land on my doorstep were kind of slim. Um, if I had if I had done that maybe 15 if I'd gone no contact maybe 15 years earlier or 20 years earlier I think people would have had more energy and more time to devote to it and they probably would have tried to pursue me and turn up on my doorstep so there was a lot of factors that kind of you know few different factors from the whole thing that did lean towards my advantage with the particular timing of me going no contact. Um, and yeah, so the terror that I felt in terms of what support I had, I had a couple of friends which were good. They knew, they knew about it. Um, 
so that was good to talk about that. I was working with one professional at the time, so that was kind of good to bounce stuff off her, but I will say it wasn't anywhere what I would have needed. So it was a bit of a solo independent journey. I didn't have a team of people supporting me. And to add to that, the there was two friends that I did have in Ireland who my family contacted and those relationships of over 20 years just fell by the wayside. So definitely um, there is a lot of fallout when we go no contact and some families will create an almighty fuss about it such as mine did and they'll contact um, anybody they know who is in your inner circle and they will try to get those people on their side so that they can ostracize you. It's like that, um, you know, like when humans lived many millennia ago and they were tri we, we lived in tribes and maybe villages, so like thousands and thousands of years ago. And if one person was ostracized and they had to go and live in the woods or something, you're not going to get on very well. It's very threatening to your life support and, and how you live. So it's, it's, that, it's that dynamic that still plays out with the dysfunctional family and the family scapegoat. They really um, go to great lengths to communicate with people they know who are close to you and spin them lines so that they can get those people to be their flying monkeys and get those people onto their team. And there was like with those two, two friends who did know my family, they obviously couldn't, um, they couldn't wrap their heads around what I was doing and they, I guess, sided with my family. They said, well, your family is right. Uh, like one of them said, you're hurting the people who love and care for you most. So in their mind, they were very much, Mary is to blame here. Mary's hurting her family. Even though I was friends with these people for 20 years, um, so there is a big blind spot in society and they even you know set up a whatsapp group with my family my family and my those people who were my friends got into this whatsapp group because one of the friends who i was closest to did actually tell me in a <laughs> in a message or in a in a phone call we had um it was it was all very very strange very strange time. Um, so that is the main points there of my journey of no contact. Um, obviously, well not obviously, but I will say I don't regret anything I did. I'm very happy to be no contact. I will say that I'm actually very proud of myself for going no contact and yeah, as I was just, I don't prepare much for videos, I just um, speak, but one of the things I was feeling before I started recording this video was uh, I'm proud of myself for being able to do that, being able to step away from people who were unable to stop hurting me um, and proud of being able to protect my mental health and my physical health and my emotional well-being. So yes, I'm very proud to be no contact with my family of origin and all extended family and anybody who associates with my family of origin because that's the boundaries that I personally require. Um, to maintain my mental health. 
Um, so yes, I don't have any qualms about sharing um, about my experience or going no contact or talking about things that happened in my family of origin um, and I do it with the intent to help other people who are in the same a similar position that I am who are struggling and who don't have a voice with it and who are scared to talk about it and nobody needs to talk about it and maybe people are not in a position to are very very restricted about what they can do with their current situation so that for me is a motivating factor for me to openly discuss this topic and um, share my personal experience, what it was like for me, how I navigated things and all of that. So thank you for listening to my video. I hope it was helpful to you and maybe there's a few other pieces of this story that I can also continue to share with you. There are other aspects of the whole process of going no contact um, and as I say for me in 2017 that last visit I did not know was going to be my last visit so there's no you know it's it's not really something that's a smooth journey and everything is going to go perfect with it you know, there's things that we can't account for or know how they're, we can't know how things are gonna play out. We're not gonna do things perfectly. I probably didn't do things perfectly, but that's life. Um, so yes, there's a few other videos I can do, educational videos around this process of no contact. Maybe even I can talk about low contact as well but this is the main thing that I wanted to share in this video. Thank you very much for watching.